the theologically deep subject of sodium chloride. That's what we'll look at, all right? So let's pray. Father, we bow this morning to recognize that you're God. I find it amazing that you've never closed your eyes in sleep. You've never... And it doesn't take but just a few hours to wear us out. And I want to thank you for being a God of eternity, a God of power, authority, but a God of goodness. You use your power to do only that which is perfect and holy so we can trust you. And I ask you to bless those requests mentioned this morning. Be what is needed in every case. Be our health, our encouragement, be our strength, our direction, our wisdom. Thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 5. As I mentioned, this is the, uh, the inaugural address of the Lord. He's been recently baptized by John the Baptist, and he's been introduced as the Messiah of the Old Testament, and there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament telling about Jesus. He was coming where he was born. Uh, exactly where Christ was born is prophesied in the book of Micah. Pretty amazing. And <clears throat> so now, when, when a president is elected, he has the, uh, <clears throat> his inaugural address, and he tells the country, this is what we want to do, and this is the direction we want to go. That's what we're talking about here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It is him. This is not a public address, by the way. This is a private discipleship meeting uh, in these three chapters. And so he said, look at verse number 1 now. And seeing the multitudes, that's the public, just the general public, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came. So the, the public has gone home. The disciples now have gathered around him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, see the word blessed, 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 blessed. It's a plural word, and it means happiness says. It's not just singular, it's plural. And so uh, in terms of life, can we experience happiness? In every area of life. Can. Now, do we always? No. Is it available? Yeah. Then my question is, Jim, what's your problem? You know, if you're not happy, what? why not? Because you've got all the information here. So anyway, verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor. That doesn't sound like a real happy way to start things, does it? But the word poor means empty. The word spirit means self. So here's what Jesus said. You're going to be happy if you're empty of yourself. When you're full of yourself, you're miserable. you full. Yes, sir. Yep. And that's why I think pastors need to break this stuff down so you can understand it. Because this was written, you're right, this was translated. this way today you know I don't say to my wife how art thou my beloved I love thee with all my bowels I don't talk like that to my wife and, and <laughs> I do it one time that's why that would be <laughs> you love me with all your what um, now verse number uh, we're, we're gonna for the sake of time I want to get down uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13 Jesus says this, you are the salt of the earth. Of all the minerals in and on the earth, why did he choose sodium chloride? You're the salt of the earth. If the salt have lost its savor or its, its flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Um, when, uh, when Jesus used analogies, he compared us to either things or, or animals. And what, what animal sheep? You know how you know how dumb sheep are? <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes he uses other analogies, but the majority of it were sheep, were followers. And uh, when a when a person gets saved, here's what happens. His old nature, his original sin nature, is executed. Not knocked out, executed. Your sin nature is crucified. All right, that means that we've got to have another nature installed in us so that we can 
communicate with the Lord, and, and what, what is that? The person of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple. This is not the, don't call this the house of God. This is not the house of God. This is a building at 1321 East Main Street. Where is the house of God? You are. That's exactly right. You are the building. And so I get tickled at people. They would never dare do, you know, anything immoral or anything like that in this building. But look what we do in the actual temple. You know, it, it's kind of an oxymoron to me. But anyway, um, we are, he, he did not use these random analogies. And, and I find one of the most interesting analogies that Jesus used is in Matthew 5.13 when he said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, why would he use that? And we'll get to that, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is not a compliment, okay? This is an assignment. When he looked at the disciples and said, you are the salt of the earth, he just gave them an assignment. This, in essence, is a commission. And about 4,700 years ago, there was published in China... <clears throat> a document called the Ping Tsao Can Mu. And what that was, it was the earliest known treatise that we have record of about pharmacology. And the Chinese were kind of the, the tip of the spear in, uh, in getting salt out of the ground. And what they would do, they would take bamboo shafts and drive it real deep down in the ground, and they would strike these pools of salt water. And it would boil up, they would get the, the water, the brine, they would boil it and get the salt out of it. And that is pretty much still the way we farm for salt today. That's, that's the way we get salt out of the ground. And um, it, it also, uh, there, there are 40 different kinds of salts, by the way, and you use it to put on your food. There are certain foods you just can't eat without salt, right? Grits, green beans, mashed potatoes, you've got to have salt on them. And uh, so it, we can do that. Uh, Y'all have water softeners at your house? Every few weeks, we have a guy come from Culligan, and he'll take out the, you know, one of those old times, put a new one in, and replace the salt. Salt also will soften water. Um, and so Jesus has, has told us something very interesting here. And about 1450 B.C., we found some records of Egyptian salt works and they did basically the same thing that the Chinese did they would sink these shafts uh, pipe type things down into the ground and the Romans were massive build everything the Romans did they overdid you know what I'm saying they just they had enough money to do it and um, they would uh, they would take salt as a matter of fact uh, Adam said there was a time when salt was called white gold and it was traded on the Mali trade route and it was traded ounce for ounce with gold. And up until about the 19th century, uh, Bithynia, which we know today is Ethiopia, they, they, would, they had stuff called amole. And amole was bars of salt. And they used it to trade, to buy, and, uh, and invest. And so it, it's a pretty, pretty significant mineral. And... Uh, there are over 14,000 uses for salt. That's, that's pretty amazing to me. It is the most common non-metallic mineral in the world. As a matter of fact, it is so abundant that the United States has 55 trillion metric tons of salt in the ground. Now, there are enough salt reserves in the United States given our current rate of usage to last us over 100,000 years. Salt is everywhere. Um, there's enough salt in the world's oceans, for instance. You could sculpt uh, a full-scale topographic map of Europe five times over. You could build a wall around the equator 180 feet high and one mile wide, all the way around the equator the, the, the biggest part of the earth. Um, pretty amazing. When, the, when a baby was born in Israel back many, many, many generations ago, they would rub that baby in salt because salt is an antibiotic. And if there was uh, like a bacteria or something on that baby, it would, kill the, it would kill the bacteria on that child. 
And um, they would use salt in a lot of their offerings to the Lord. They were supposed to put salt in it. And up until uh, just the, the 20th century, I said, uh, uh, Abyssinia, or what we know today as Ethiopia, uh, would use this as money. The Romans would, matter of fact, the word salary, you know what the word salary means? Salt. Have you ever heard anybody say he's not worth his salt? What does that mean? He's not worth the money you're paying him? Where did we get that idea from? Well, the word salary is the word salt money. And so guess who many, many generations ago paid their workers in salt? The Romans did. And if they had, uh, they would have salt houses. And they would have blocks of salt, bars of salt. And the weather, the moisture, uh, if, it would, if it would wash the flavor of the salt out down into the ground, you would have just this big pile of white powder. It wasn't worth anything, but you had a lot of it. That's simply called inflation. Inflation is not when you don't have any money. Inflation is when you've got plenty of money, but it's not worth anything. And so what would they do with it? Well, Jesus said it perfectly. He said it's good for nothing because you salt, salt. It's good for nothing to be thrown out and trodden under the foot of men. You know what the Romans did with the salt that wasn't worth anything? They would take it through their extensive road system and fill up potholes. And guess what men did? They'd walk on it. They'd ride their horses over it. They'd, they'd take their chariots and their wagons over it. Exactly what Jesus said would happen. Now, sodium chloride is it's a combination of two separate elements, sodium. Uh, sodium is a very unstable metal, is poison. Chloride or chlorine is a very unstable gas. If there's a train wreck and you've got these tankers, and if a green cloud starts forming around what you got, you got problems what you got because you got a chlorine leak and everybody gets out of Dodge. Get on your, get on your donkey and get gone. That stuff will kill you. But so we've got two completely separate poisonous substances. If you combine them chemically, guess what you get? Salt. You can sprinkle it on your green beans. It's absolutely amazing. Now, uh, salt is essential to your health. There's, a, there's an ocean of salt outside your cells. There's an ocean of salt inside your cells. And if this is not kept in balance, you've got some real bad health problems. Uh, the, uh, there's a, a medical condition called hyponatremia, and that's when your salt gets out of balance. Years ago, I don't know if you all remember, there was a young lady by the name of Jennifer Strange. Anybody, does that ring a bell with anybody? Jennifer Strange was in a contest Hold your Wii for a Wii. You remember the game station, the Wii game station? And if you could, you, you drink water, don't go to the bathroom. Whoever held it the longest won this Wii. Well, this young lady did that so long, it killed her. She, had, she died of hyponatremia because the, the balance of the salt got so out of whack. And um, so salt also, if you lived up north, we've got somebody from Pennsylvania here, We've never done this down here, to my knowledge. Uh, if, if the roads get icy and snowy, what do they do? They salt the roads. they got salt trucks. Remember just a couple of years ago, they had that big snowstorm in Atlanta? <laughs> it wasn't funny, but it just it's very typical of how Southerners handle bad weather. People were sliding off the road, having wrecks. They spent the night in their car. It was a nightmare. It was a train wreck because we didn't know how to handle that stuff, but you go up north in the wintertime, and the roads are perfectly clear, right? I mean, they know how to handle that stuff up there. The largest salt reserve, or salt flat, I guess, in the world is the Sailor de Oina, which is in Bolivia, and it is 4,000 square miles of salt flat, and as a matter of fact, it is, it is so perfectly laid out that a small layer of water, if it rains, turns that thing into a gigantic mirror. And so guess what they use to calibrate satellites? They use this salt flat when it's got water on it as this mirror, and they can calibrate uh, their, uh, their satellite off of this thing. And so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yes, sir.
Butter and salt. Oh, okay. I never, anybody ever heard of that? Butter and salt? I never heard of that. Sound like she's about to put you in the oven. I didn't know what that was. Okay. And it worked. I'd never heard of that part of it anyway. Um, well, Jesus referred to us as salt. Uh, now, what does that mean? Why would he say you're the salt of the earth? Let me just share with you some things before we quit this morning. Number one, salt flavors. Uh, it's, the, it's the oldest food spice on earth. It is the only rock that humans regularly eat, and it is a rock. Of course, we grind it up, you know, sometimes it's a powder, sometimes it's, it's not quite as, as fine as that, but it makes food palatable, Right? It makes it flavorful. Uh, what can what What are some foods that you just cannot eat without putting salt on it? Hamburger. There you go. Hamburger. Uh, pretty much anything to me. You, you know, put a little salt on it, and uh, every now and then, you know, Stacy said, "Well, taste it before you put salt on it." And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> you know, just go ahead and put salt. You you know, it's got to have some salt on it anyway." Um, and so. What do you think Christians have done for the world for the last 2,000 years? You think we've made human culture more palatable? What if, what if there were no Christians in the world at all? What do you think the world would taste like? What if there was no, uh, no principle, no value, there's no worldview, no killing, uh, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt, you know, all of, the, all of the moral values, the greatest moral guide on earth is the Bible. What if that was not in existence? We would be a bunch of animals, and pretty much are, you know, in, in many parts of the world anyway. But I, I want to, I thank you. We've got Christians in this room today. You've made my life more palatable. You've made, uh, so thank you for that. This is, our, this is our assignment. Now again, this matter of you're the salt of the earth was not a compliment. This was a commission. It was assignment. Go be the salt of the earth. And if you, <clears throat> your salt loses its flavor, what do you do with it? Throw it away. Uh, you can have a full box and let it sit there for years. It'll, it'll eventually lose its flavor, and it's good for nothing. And so we as Christians, we've got to keep our saline contents. Keep your saline content up. Well, first of all, your personal relationship with the Lord is absolutely vital. I hope that this is not the only time that we pray and, you know, turns our, turn our minds toward the Lord. And so salt flavors. Another thing that salt does, it preserves. Um, salt attracts water. And if you've ever sprained your ankle uh, or, or something like that and you put it in Epsom salts, what does, what does salt do? Salt pulls, it pulls moisture. moisture. Um, years ago, before we had refrigeration, guess how our ancestors would preserve meat? They'd salt the meat. They'd pack it. I saw my granddad just pack a ham and salt one time, and he hung it up and let it stay there for several weeks. And when he got ready to, to eat, he had to, he had to get a hammer because the salt was about that thick and hard as Japanese arithmetic, and he had to beat it off with a hammer. And when he beat it off with a hammer, it, it, was, it was dry. All the salt, all the, the water had been pulled out by the salt, and that's what Epsom salts does. If you sprain your ankle or something, it'll, it'll pull the, the blood out. And if you have a flea problem, for instance, in your carpets, you know how to get rid of fleas? Take salt. Sprinkle salt all on your carpet and leave it there for about a week. And in about a week, get your vacuum cleaner and vacuum up the dead fleas. Because what the fleas will do, they'll eat the salt. And it'll dry them up. And so it's, it'll preserve things. Uh, I think that we as Christians have had a preservative effect on the world. I think Christianity, and we're, we're watching a DVD uh, on Wednesday nights now about the Christian founding of the country. And I'm telling you this, 
The United States was founded based on biblical principle. All right, that, that, that is more than easily proven. Had that not happened, this country would be like any other country, any other secular pagan country. Why is the United States so unique in the nations of the world? Why? Why do people risk life and limb and family to come here? Why do they do that? Why is this the place everybody wants to come? Are, 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 our, are our rivers any cleaner? Are our mountains any higher? No. We have more freedom here. Now, is that starting to change? Yeah, that, that's been changing for a while. But I'm grateful that our ancestors wanted to build a nation based on the principles of the scriptures, and they did. And be here Wednesday night, and we'll, we'll finish watching that, uh, that DVD. But biblical principles have stayed God's hand of judgment from this country for decades. Now here's, just watch what happens. When you begin to eliminate biblical principles from your government, your government will begin to rot. It'll begin to deteriorate. When you take biblical principles out of your schools, your school system will begin to rot. They'll start to teach stuff like, ah, you can choose your own gender. Really? I mean, that's as mindless as it gets. What about churches? Take biblical values out of churches. Just make it an entertainment center. Make it a theological nightclub. What happens? It will deteriorate. It will rot. It will fall apart. You take biblical values out of the family. What happens? That family will rot and fall apart. And so what I'm telling you is simply this. Christians have preserved the United States, I think, for centuries. We have had the effect, our, our moral values, our principles of how to treat neighbors, I, all of those things are the salt that has preserved the culture of America. And so I, do you want to be part of that salt that keeps that going? I really do. I do. And I'm not talking about being holier than thou. I hate that stuff. Uh, I'm talking about just being what God has designed us to be. And this is a part of our assignment, you know, is to be the salt of the earth. Now, another thing that salt does, it'll sting an open wound. You want to get set on fire? If you've got a cut and you're working and sweat runs down, <laughs> it will set you on fire. If you, you know, you've got a little scratch here in the corner of your eye and you get a tear in that, it will it'll burn you. Uh, it's an irritant to an open sore. Do you think that Christianity stings the open wound of this world? Oh boy. It's, it sets the world on fire. They cannot stand what we teach. We teach there's one God. Well, what about all these other gods? We teach there's one God. Well, what about these other gods? There are no other gods. I'm not being rude. I'm just telling the truth. All right? There is no other God but one. And that, he's not an American God. He's not a Japanese God. He's God. He is the God of the universe. And are there, are there certain principles by which God wants us to live our lives? Yes, absolutely. What if we ignore those things? Buckle up. Get ready to pay the price. Because uh, God has designed life to work a certain way. It's just like uh, automobile manufacturers. If they build a diesel engine, what do they expect that engine to run on? Diesel. How about, can, can we save some money? Let's, let's put, uh, I'll tell you what, let's fill our diesel tanks up with water tomorrow. That would save a lot of money, right? Uh, probably not. In the long run, you're going to buy a new engine. So what I'm telling you is this, life works this way. And if we as Christians do not live according to the principles of the Bible, deteriorate to the point where it would be absolutely worthless. And I think we are the perfect example of what happens when a nation 
builds its foundation for existence on the Bible. In 450 A.D., all right, we're talking about a long time ago, there were two brothers that moved their, their people into the British Isles. Their names were Hengist and Horsa. These two guys moved into the British Isles, and they brought with them a set of laws called People's Law. And People's Law was, it was an unwritten law. And, and the, you say, well, why was it unwritten? Because they thought people had enough, uh, had enough common sense, don't kill anybody. Why would you need to write that down? Don't kill. Don't steal. I mean, everybody ought to know, don't steal. You just don't do that. And it, it, that became a weakness of that part of the law, so eventually it was written down. But guess where our founders got a lot of the principles for the Constitution of the United States? Guess where they got a lot of that from? People's law. Exactly right. Because they discovered that, and for 180 years, we were looking for a way from, from uh, the, the founding of Jamestown to the Constitutional Convention, we were looking for a for what, what kind of government do we want? We don't want a king. We just got away from that mess in England. We don't want a, We don't want anything like that. And so we looked for 180 years to try to find a good form of government. And so they read men, Polybius, Cicero, uh, John Locke, all these guys that were brilliant, brilliant men in past days. And, and so they began to put these things together. And boom, we have a document based on the Bible. And I'm very thankful. I am very thankful that the beginning of this country was that and not socialism or communism. I am so thankful that we have that kind of a, of a kickoff because we're still enjoying the freedoms of that today. And so salt preserves, it will, but it will sting an open wound. And so if you witness to somebody <clears throat> and they're involved in some kind of an immoral lifestyle, and if you happen to drop some of the salt of biblical truth, guess probably what's going to happen. They're not going to like that. Well, who do you think you are? Well, it's not who I think I am. It's, it's who God, you know, who God is and what he has said concerning the way life should be lived. Now, let's look at one more thing. Salt creates thirst. What are some foods that you can eat that will make you thirsty for days? Is, is, what was It's what? Okay. Sunflower seeds. Mine is, is shrimp. If I eat shrimp, I'd be thirsty for uh, stuff. Yeah, eat, I guess fish, you know, any kind of salt water um, would, uh, would make you do that. But here's what happens. Salt dries up water. In your body, you eat a lot of salt. It dries up the water, and you need to replenish the water. So you're going to drink a lot of water. It pulls water out of the cells, and it's, it's, there's an old expression that we, you've heard it probably a thousand times. You can drive a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yes, you can. Feed him salt. You don't have to make him drink. You have to make him thirsty. And so if, if you've got horses, uh, and we had some horses up in Kissimmee years ago, and we'd put salt blocks out in the, in the pasture, and boy, they'd run to it. They need mineral. And they'd lick and 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 lick, 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 lick. And after they had all they wanted, they'd throw the head up, and it sounded like they were breathing, you know, blowing, but they were smelling. Guess what they were trying to find? Water. Guess what we provided right up by the fence? Water. And here they come, boogity, 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 boogity. They'd run up there and drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. So, you know, the deal is, I didn't have to make them drink. All I had to do was make them thirsty. Now, here's a question. You don't, you don't have to force people to get saved. Okay? We can't do that. Uh, I pastor a church here. I can't make anybody walk this aisle and get saved. What can we do? Make them thirsty. Make them thirsty. So how do you, how do you make somebody thirsty? Here's a way you make somebody thirsty. Be the salt. Just be salt. So how do you be salt? Surrender your heart, your values to the Lord Jesus Christ. Become a living translation of the truths of this Bible. Walk in the path that God has paved for us to walk in. And people will see that. They will, they will 
acknowledge there's something very different about your life. You know, you don't, you don't go the places they go. You don't laugh at the things they laugh at. You don't watch what they watch. They're, they're, and, you, and you're happy about it. There's a, there's a, there, have you ever been around somebody that just exuded happiness? I mean, just like they were, something great had happened to them, and, well, something had happened to them, you know, to get saved. And then to walk in those ways, uh, we are the salt that makes people thirsty for the water of life. Your life is the greatest apologetic there is. Now, there's a, there's a class that we teach over in school called apologetics. And it has nothing to do with apologizing. Um, the term apologetics means to set forth a reason for our faith. It is a, defense, a reasonable defense of the faith that we believe. Well, we can, we, we can present truth, and we do, you know. We go through Scripture, and this, this is why we believe this, this is why we believe that. But ultimately, you know what is one of the most powerful forms of apologetics in the world? It's us. It's the way we live life. It's easy to yakety, 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 yak. It's easy to talk. But it's completely different to walk your talk. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, now, you can... Uh, you can oversalt things. Teaching in a camp, uh, a youth camp up in Dry Branch, Georgia, many, many years ago, uh, 2011. And one night at dinner, they had served beans, which is a staple at camp, I guess. And I sat down, and I had my, uh, my plate, and I started eating some green beans. And as soon as I put them in my mouth, I was like, hmm, hmm, hmm. They got my. Well, wow. they, were, they were so salty you couldn't eat them. And I started looking around, you know, and all the kids were like, they were spitting their green beans out. Now, what's the point of that? You can be too salty. I was in a restaurant one time. There was a bunch of us guys sitting at a table, and the food came. And there was a preacher that was with us, stood up in this restaurant. And this restaurant was fairly crowded. Can I have your attention, please? Can everybody, can, can y'all, everybody just stop just for a moment? We're going to pray over here. And he prayed. You say, well, wow, that, I think that's oversalting. You know, that's, that's, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to brag about who you are. Be who you are. You know what I'm saying? And it just, it got deathly quiet in the restaurant. It, it embarrassed everybody in the restaurant. And, and what I'm telling you, um, and, and I've known people that they would leave a track instead of a tip. Anything wrong with leaving a track in a restaurant for the server? Anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. How about putting a tip in the track? Okay. Uh, is it, let's see, lose some, use some common sense here. And Jesus simply said, if you lose your flavor, have you, has there ever been a point in your life when you just started losing your desire to do the right thing? You just, you don't want to do this anymore, and you start to lose your flavor. And I would just encourage you, get around God's people. This should be the resalting place of your life, where, where the Lord is allowed access to everything in our lives. And when we lose our ability to influence and impact and create thirst in our culture, we cease to be effective. So let's, I guess, take inventory of our lives and see who am I impacting? Who am I making thirsty for the water of life? Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. I pray that you bless our service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.